Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Roberts. I'm the Director of Education for the Dallas Opera. I'm here with my fabulous colleague and co-host. Quodicia Johnson, Education and Company Culture Manager for the Dallas Opera. And we are strolling through again with another episode of Taking the Stage with Christian. And Quo. One of the things we've started doing and one of the things we will continue to do is a land and people acknowledgement. We take this time right here in this space, in this place, to acknowledge that here in Dallas, we are on stolen land. We are on the land of the Caddo, of the Wichita, and of the Comanche sovereign nations. Nations that faced policy, that faced horrible conditions, that faced genocide, that forced the removal of themselves from their land. So we want to acknowledge that people were forced from their land so that other can come in and settle the land. And we do this not to place blame, but we do this to acknowledge that there is power in truth telling. We do this to acknowledge that those communities are still here and that they are thriving and that their voices are invaluable in the work that we're doing. We also take this time to acknowledge that people were stolen from their homes off the coast of Africa and brought here and forced into labor. And in that Dallas being on stolen land is built by stolen labor. Again, we do this to acknowledge that while we have inherited these things, we did not create these conditions. We do have the opportunity, we have the honor, we have the responsibility, we have the ability to make sure that we center connection, to make sure that we center truth, to make sure that we reduce the harm and that we move together going forward. Dallas is not alone in this as the entire nation has these very things to deal with so we thank you for joining us in the work and we thank you for joining us in this land and people acknowledgement. And we also thank you for joining us and for your continued support. I also want to be sure to thank the TDO staff. Thank you for your support, continued support and our viewers and stuff at home. We very much appreciate you. Shout out to our boy, David Lomeli. Hey, David. This of course, TDO Network is his brainchild. So we always want to acknowledge um, and, and give credit where credit is due. So on today's show, Kapaya. <laughs> kapaya. <laughs> we have three fierce ladies with us today. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an absolute pleasure to join you all and have you all here today. Um, let's, let's get you all introduced. Let's introduce, I, you know what? We're gonna let you introduce yourselves. Let's just do it that way, all right? So um, who would like to go first? Kitty. Yes, my name my name is Linda Collazo, and this is my cat. Her name is Orchata, which is named after the Spanish drink. You know, she's white with a little bit of touches of brown. Um, but yeah, my name is Linda Collazo. I'm a mezzo soprano from the South Bronx, New York. Um, I started studying opera when I was 13 years old after getting into LaGuardia High School. Um, and from there, I, I always say that opera picked me and opera um, sort of shaped my life and saved my life in many ways. Um, I have gone on to perform as a young artist on Sarasota Opera, and most recently I performed with him at Opera Guild. Um, and uh, yeah, I, and as, along with performing, I'm also a teacher. I work at PPAS, the Professional Performing Arts School in Manhattan, as well as the Point CDC, which is a nonprofit in the South Bronx that offers free arts education to Bronx youth and right now youth from all over the United States since um, it's all virtual. And yeah, I'm one of the co-founders of LWO, which is really exciting. All right. I, I guess I can go next. Um, uh, my name is Cynthia Lopez Perez. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I identify as Chicana. And for those who don't know what that term is, um, it's just somebody who identifies as Mexican, um, either native or descends from um, the Mexican nationality. Um, I was born in Compton, California, raised in Newark, Ohio. Um, I'm the daughter of two humble and hardworking immigrants who are my absolute everything and um, inspire every move I make. Um, and most recently I graduated with my master's in opera performance uh, from Boston Conservatory. And currently I'm working with Promenade Opera Project as an online artist in residence. I am uh, performing the role of Leonor from Fidelio. 
um, very big role. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's been really, really fun. And uh, it's been really great to uh, find ways, creative ways to be creative at home. Like I, I have a scene where I'm shoveling and I have my little shovel and I'm shoveling laundry and you know, it's just like, you gotta be creative, especially yeah. right now. Cause we don't know how long we're gonna be stuck indoors. <laughs> um, and, and I'm one of the co-founders of Latina Women Opera, which I hold so close and dear to my heart, not only with these wonderful um, ladies who are involved with it, uh, with me, who are some of my best friends, but also just with all of the people we have, um, we have reached all of the people who have uh, messaged us and contacted us telling us how, how much they really needed the platform. And to me, it, it's just, it's been, it's been so rewarding. And it's, it's, I mean, my life, obviously, I, you know, I'm one of those opera chose me people for sure. But my life also keeps going back to this diverse city um, arts leadership. And that's something that I'm equally as passionate about, like my love for opera. Cool. Yay. Uh, I love you girls. I love everyone who is here. And uh, I'm so happy and so thankful um, that we are getting to, to talk today together and that the universe brought us together. Um, my name is Maria Brea, and I am Venezuelan, I'm born in Venezuela, in Caracas, and I'm also Trinidadian, of the, the Trinidadian descent. My grandmother was from San Fernando, and I grew up in a slum in Caracas, and one of the most dangerous slums that you could ever imagine. That's where I grew up. And um, my parents both uh, were orphans in some way, for lacking of a parent. Um, they work really hard. My mom is a medical doctor. She makes $2 a month. My country is in a big crisis. For people who don't know what's happening in Venezuela, please check it out. Um, mm. It's not cute. Mm. Um, and I feel incredibly grateful um, to be where I am because I grew up with no you know, no luxuries, but I had my parents who were trying to give us the best education that they could. And music was one of the things that my dad gave to my sister and I. Um, and um, just in general, lots of books and lots of instruments like mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, me and my dad, so many weird instruments at home. Um, <laughs> and um, that changed my life. and. I was able to come to the US on my first plane ever that I, that I ever took. And I took an audition at Manhattan School of Music, fast forward. And um, through the support of my teachers who believed in me, I got a, a full scholarship there. I still needed money to be able to cover my insurance and food because you gotta say that to the government here so that they let you come in. And a uh, uh, lady, filmed a, a documentary which is in YouTube actually in my house my humble 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 house and um, a lady with a lot of money <laughs> thank you she paid for my education and expected absolutely nothing nothing in return for for the food and the insurance she was providing and um, fast forward I graduated I was able to get a, a fellowship uh, at Juilliard School of Music and I'm still so grateful at Juilliard for all the, the, the money they gave me. I, I really appreciate it. I was um, the only Latina, I think, in my I in the scholarship from the singers. And it was the only Latina in my class in the whole mm -hmm. master's program. Um, and I um, I'm very grateful. I am expecting twins. And um, I have been able to do a couple things while I've been pregnant. I just did a production with Teatro Graticello, which is being premiered very soon. It, um, we did Fedora and uh, I am incredibly grateful for that. I'm recording next week a piece about my country that was written uh, and commissioned by, by uh, an organization and, and a Venezuelan composer. Every time I sing through this piece, I cry and uh, because it's about my country. 
And uh, one of the things that I am fighting for is, you know, coming from my country, seeing the injustice in my country, which is different, it's a different country, and finding the injustices here, how can I help in the world, in my world back home, in my world here to make injustice go? Because injustice is injustice, and we cannot cover it with our thumb, right? We just gotta work through it. So it's me, and I love LWO. That's my house, and it's my home. And I'm hoping that we can help other people who need it. Told y'all, fire. <laughs> um, it's game time. Um, so let's talk a little bit because. Um, We've heard a little bit about your backgrounds, um, your passion, all three of you is clearly, it clearly comes through um, in all of this. And um, we sort of came to know you through Instagram and Bo was like, we gotta get, we gotta get, gotta get them on here. Um, and so um, some stalking ensued um, and it is, it is great to meet you all and to be with you today. Um, so I kind of want to start a little bit of, because you've talked a little bit about kind of how you got into opera, what sparked your interest, who was your influences and that sort of thing. And I think we've covered that question pretty well, but if it, if it you know, if it, if it if later on in the conversation, if something else pops up, please feel free to talk more about that because I like people hearing background stories and understanding that we come from all different places um, in this field. And it's important that we, um, that we acknowledge that. And then it's important that we have seats at the table um, for those different places and background. And so um, I, I do wanna ask this though, why opera? I can go first. Um, so I, at least for, this is a huge question. <laughs> um, so for me, I chose opera because I love to share my perspective of characters on stage. And that's like really something that's really important to me to, to add my, my ingredients I guess mm -hmm. opera that makes me feel like that that makes me feel like a creator like an artist like I'm expressing myself through somebody else's shoes um and for me I find it uh, really fascinating and this is just me um you know I find it fascinating to dive deep into composer lives and time periods and history and the nerdy stuff and then put on my like composer hat and to understand why a certain composer, you know, picked specific instruments or like why a composer, um, like what their political ideologies were during big political movements, mm -hmm. like the opera I'm in Fidelio, um, that made them choose to write about that opera. Um, and so like my, my girls know that I'm a very analytical person and I'm a very left brain person. Um, and it's like, for me, opera lets me do that, but it also lets me feel and express. And it's such mm -hmm. an outlet for me. Um, and it's something that I continuously thirst for. So, I mean, and, and you know, and not to mention that my parents literally came to this country with nothing. Um, mm -hmm. it was like four of us in, or five, it was six of us. <laughs> I can't. Um, six of us in one bedroom apartment with no furniture, like nothing. Um, you know, I, when I was a kid, like we were held at gunpoint. My mom said that somebody grabbed me, like shook me upside down as a baby. And, mm. um, you know, she, you know, and th there's a lot of history with that. And um, they came here so that we could live our dreams. And so that we didn't have to work to barely survive like they had to, you know, in their respective countries and, and for my case, Mexico. And so I see so much joy in their eyes. Sorry, I'm getting like really, sorry if I'm ranting, I'm getting really personal. No, no, take the space, it's yours. Yeah. I see so much joy in their eyes when they know that how, how much the work that I'm doing fulfills me. And, um, and that, that brings me a lot of joy. Um, so that's why I chose opera. I love it. It's beautiful. All right, who else? So I'll say, um, I, I come back to this question over and over again because I do think it's like 
sometimes I think it's strange that like a girl, a Latina girl from the South Bronx is an opera singer. Um, and a lot of people think it's strange that are in my vicinity and people that I work with, people that I've gone to school with, are like, she became an opera singer, what? Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest aha moments I had with the opera world and why I, I want to stay in it was um, I sang with the Opera Collective for a little bit before the pandemic, um, which is a, a group that, a diverse group of singers that sings in the subway. They basically busk to just make money and like, you know, sometimes you don't make a lot of money, sometimes you do, but it's more just, just for the joy, you know, and mm -hmm. what I found really moving about doing that was the amount of people of different backgrounds, colors, ethnicities who would stop and just watch in awe. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the children, you know, I would have these black babies, like toddlers, like just like Full of filled with joy just watching someone like them you know perform you know I, I was let I, I'm Latina and I was one of the singers there but they also had a lot of black singers too and and we would move people of color to tears um on their way back home from work or like on their way to work mm. um so to me it just it kind of makes me realize you know yeah opera is a little bit classist it's hard to really get into in our in our world in America but if it's easy to access it's it can be very grand it's really special you know it's 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 big it's beautiful there's there's really nothing like it um so that's kind of why i i stick to it i just think it's just out of this world and really beautiful and powerful beautiful beautiful um, my position with it constantly, uh, it, it has evolved. Um, the first time I heard something that was kind of classical that really touched my soul was my dad brought me um, a CD of cantatas of Bach. Mm. He was picking up stuff, random stuff from everywhere. <laughs> that's mm. just, that's just Fernando, Fernando Brea, my dad. <laughs> And um, so I was doing a project for PowerPoint in the school. And then he, you know, I used the music and I was like, wow, that's so beautiful. And uh, I just felt it. I mean, my dad put so much like different music in our heads and in our ears. And that somehow, I think there was something about the vulnerability of this human voice that connected me to it. Uh, but as I have grown as an adult, um, I realized that opera, it is perceived as an European form, but we cannot forget um, as Latin American people. And I, I was doing some research on, on, I've been doing research on this for a couple of years. We have contributed to opera. We made it our own. We have opera in Latin America, okay? And as we have black composers in the US. So it has changed and it doesn't belong to anyone. Uh, it belongs to whoever wants to take it. It's just like anything else. This is just like social media. Can you say that social media belongs to someone? It's the same with opera. And we have contributed with our own traditions. We have operas that have indigenous uh, um, touches in it. We have operas that have Caribbean touches in it. We have operas that uh, show and portray the diversity and the instruments and the culture of Latin America, as well as art song and, and classical music. And we cannot deny that. So now it feels like it is mine too. And it is something I am part of. And I do not have to explain or feel like I have to fit into something because it is mine too. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you so much for just this beautiful, very raw, very, very honest kind of connection in the ways that you all show up in the operatic space, but also in the ways that you give to the operatic space. Um, and then I want to touch on something well, something that all three of you have said, but just in the way that you put it in the in that it's grand. And so often we're like, oh, grand opera, it's grandiose, this blah, 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 blah. But it is grand, it is 
big and big enough, as Maria said, it's big enough to belong to everybody. Big enough to hold the space for everybody. Big enough for us to, to see that joy and that passion, as Cynthia said, so that our parents can be proud in the ways that we give to the space, but also in the ways that we provide connection to other people. It's so much bigger than just, oh, this is a European art form. Cool. <laughs> Great. And it, they, they're doing it up in Europe. Yes, absolutely. But what does it mean for that to reflect us? What does it mean for it to show the ways in which as a vessel, right, as art, as a vessel, to show the ways in which we connect with one another through our own stories? I think it's beautiful um, that you'll be doing a piece about your country because who else, who else should do it? Who, who else should do it? Now you'll hear some, hear some people say, oh, I'm sure I can do that. No, no, no. Who else should do it? And in getting that very real and beautiful connection in the ways that we can start to make space and be in space and be in belonging with others and this art form does it. And so I, I thank all three of you so much for just the beautiful ways in which you're showing that it's necessary, it's possible. And it's not up for debate. Mm -hmm. It's, not, <laughs> it's yeah. not up for debate. We're not asking. This is what is happening and this is how it will continue to happen. I think that's, that it's, it, you guys, it, I just hearing all of that and then the, the, like I said, the passion behind it, it is just incredible. So thank you for that. It's very insp inspirational and I'm sure to our viewers, um, they will find it equally as inspirational. So I wanna get to some knit and grit because if we're gonna talk about it, let's talk about it. So let's talk about some of the challenges that you faced in opera, because we know this field does not come without them. And we know being women of color, particularly lately, where there have been a lot of discussions about racial justice. Um, talk to me about that. What are some of the challenges you find yourself facing? Um, the challenges obviously are going to vary according to the person. We cannot treat every person the same because um, everyone has different needs, everyone has a different background, and everyone has a different social economical uh, reality. So one of the, the issues that I personally faced, obviously, were poverty, um, coming from a long income family. I also know my privileges. Uh, as a light skinned Latina, I had experienced a different treatment that my sister who is showing more of the African roots experiences and goes through in life, even though she's not, not an opera singer. So I know my realities and my, and, and my struggles and my privileges, but I also have an accent. Too. So a lot of people definitely treated me like I was stupid because I have an accent mm -hmm. or that didn't feel that it was okay for me to speak on, in Spanish with my mom on the phone on my breaks and would just like look at me like I was weird or make some remarks or, you know, sort of like those situations like that. Um, and everyone will face a different reality. Um, what I hope for is that we all can respectfully coexist in one environment. Um, what I hope for also is for people who don't have the means um, and who don't look like pleasant to other people who have mental issues um, and are racist, mm -hmm. um, I hope for them to be able to gain those spaces. And that's a, that's a big challenge that we are facing and that hopefully now with the changes that we are experiencing in the US uh, and maybe in the world, we can change that. Good, yeah. anything to add? Uh, I, I guess like just if I were going into I absolutely agree with everything Maria said. Um, and like, you know, coming from the backgrounds, I mean, we, we, we share uh, a lot with similar backgrounds and um, very different, but, uh, but similar. Um, like, as it, it just, 
especially like when I was younger, I never really had the money to help my family and to pay for young artist programs and coachings and these lessons. And I had, as when I was younger, I had a lot of coaches and I'm sure the other two girls could relate to this. I had a lot of coaches and teachers not charge me <laughs> because they could see, visibly see how tired I was working 30 plus hours as a freshman to pay for rent, help back home, pay for my car insurance, pay for all of these things that a lot of my colleagues didn't have to. Um, so in college, when I started seeing people go to these, you know, young artist programs that were pay to sings, I remember thinking first, wow, like they must be talented. And then also looking at the tuition prices and being like, wow, these are incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's like not for me, that's not bashing and I hope that, you know, whoever hears that and is a pay to sing, like that's not bashing their, they, they're exceptional programs, but I'm, you know, I'm not even taking into account the high application fees, like to just apply and be heard. You know, if, if YAPs, especially pay to sings, do not seek initiatives to first dissolve of the application fees, then, and, and to have, you know, at the forefront initiatives to retain singers who come from lower SES, um, families like um, me and my girls, then they will lose valuable perspectives and hinder diversity, period. And that's, and that's what I'll say about that. Oh, that's good. Yes, ma'am. Preach on it. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Yes. Because it is a challenge and I feel you on that. Because I've been there. So absolutely, it's a, it's a thing. We're not making this up. It's a thing. Um, any others? I second everything that they say. Another thing that I, I will add, though, is that how strenuous it is um, schedule-wise and financially, where, like, you know, um, we pay all this money for applications, for young artist programs, for training programs when... Um, when we need them and for teachers and for coaches recordings a lot of money goes towards like getting that audition um and then the rejection and not getting a refund that's a really big problem and what's it's really hard like my experience before the pandemic was you know i was fortunate enough to be a working teacher and like i was fortunate enough to have jobs that were flexible and worked with my schedule if i had a last minute audition or performance um but it's still incredibly complicated because you know, I could take a gig and it doesn't cover me financially as much as my actual job. So there are lots of um, give and takes Like you have to really make hard decisions financially. Mm -hmm. And as already as people of color, that's really difficult. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm 24, so I'm lucky enough to say that I live with my parents and they've been able to support me. But I've seen a lot of singers you know, they're adults, they have to pay rent, they have to um, pay for their health insurance, they don't have health insurance, um, they don't have retirement, they're in debt from school. I think it's just, there's just so much financial pressure. And um, it's, I just hope that, that with this pandemic, I, I've already seen some changes with application fees. I, I just hope that there's also more understanding, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if you're a person of color, you should be given like a pass a little bit about like well, how advanced you are or how um, how much money you have. You should be given a little bit more of a shot, you know, and, and more of a the benefit of the doubt because it's just that much harder. Um, and, and that's what I have to say about that. And thank you for that. Um, in a previous episode, we, we talked about briefly about people combating the idea of handouts right yes. of oh you need to give me this for free because these things and not acknowledging that so much of the disparity comes from handouts that were already given in the form of land that belonged to other people <laughs> in the form of stolen labor in the form of the ability to amass wealth within a family um, while other people who are actually doing the work and other people who are actually suffering from not having their land were not able to do the same. And so for those who are listening, I ask that you kind of listen with the, the open mind and the open heart and understanding what it means to be equitable. It's mm -hmm. not the same as to be equal. 
that's not, we've talked about it before, equity and equality are not the same things. So what it means to know that certain groups or certain individuals, certain people with certain experiences require more resources because they have been locked out of access to those resources and that others have had greater advantage. So often the word privilege kind of bothers people because they're like, I'm not rich, I don't have privilege, but what it means to have the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. what it means to walk into the space and people already are like, oh, okay, this person is trustworthy. This person probably knows what they're doing. This person will be great for this role that I already have in my mind. Mm -hmm. that, that is where, that, is where that, that extra work comes in. That is where that extra stretching and expectation and that's the benefit of the doubt that is necessary for everybody and what it means to extend that. So I so appreciate you mentioning that and the, the necessity to be real about who actually has the ability to show up in these auditions because do we want this art form to be better or do we just want to go with whomever can afford to do it? Because that's two different things and we have to make a decision. And if we want one or the other, then that's fine. One requires more work than the other. So we have to be ready for that work, right? Mm -hmm. so much for that. I, I think I've said on number on a few occasions here, you know, most of the things that I saw when I was coming through, it wasn't that I was less talented or another singer next to me was less talented or more talented. It's just that somebody else had better advantage. You know, I'm trying to think about the application fee, let alone the money to get on the plane to fly out and the dress and the makeup and all the things that it entails, paying the pianist, you know, all of these things that we have to do. It's an expensive business to be a singer. And I think people really need to understand that. So I too appreciate what you said about that because it is very real. And there are things happening right now. There are people who are taking a look at this. There are companies taking a look at this. There are programs looking at this and they are scrapping some of those fees and others are reducing them really, really low. Keep that same energy because it's real out here. And, and, and people need to take note um, that it, 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 it's gonna look and feel different than the, form of, than, than the models that we're used to, but it's very, very real. And you know, it, it took a pandemic for some of this stuff to come through, but hey, you know, um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a positivity in that. And so um, I wanna get into the posit some of the positive things that, that and victories that you've seen come through this. And, Obviously, you know, the, the big one that we want to talk about today is, well, it's an organization, but it's a group that you have formed, right? So can you talk to us about Latina women in opera? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll go ahead and start and we'll kind of uh, segue into each, each other and uh, talk about our own sort of series that we're in charge of within the platform within the organization. Um, we're still very much in our youth. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, I met these two girls in the Martina Arroyo Prelude to Performance program. And there are about there were seven Latinx singers um, all in one program. And we were all so overjoyed um, mm -hmm. to not only, you know, a lot of us seeing each other, like seeing other people who look like us, but who talk like us too. Um, and not having to code switch was a big one uh, for all of us, I think. Uh, and, and I just, I mark that as just one of the most epic times of my life, not only just in opera, um, but in, in arts, in my arts leadership. And um, that just meeting these girls and now being involved with them with Latina Women in Opera and sharing that same passion for um, diversity, equity, and belonging is something that, that inspired uh, making Latina women in opera. So as you know, created by me, Maria Fernanda Brea, Linda Coyazo, our platform is dedicated to promoting and celebrating Latina and Latinx people in opera. And that's not just limited to singers um, because as we all know, there's so many elements to opera because it takes a village, you know, there's admin, staff, makeup artists, intimacy coaches, you know, like people we don't like think about with opera, but they exist. So, um, you know, our, our, that's one of our goals is to amplify those voices as well. And one, one of our other goals is to target um, untapped Latinx audiences that not, would not typically think of opera on a daily or even weekly basis. 
and find you know similar similarities in job sectors and just the collective human experience. Um, so that's you know, and tomorrow I have an interview with the wonderful uh, Marisol Leva, who is a, an activist, a model. Um, mm -hmm. She really has nothing to do with opera, but she is a model and she does perform. So um, just going into the the similarities within our arts mm -hmm. and um, the challenges she faces as um, an Afro Latina. Uh, a trans Afro Latina in the in that community in our community and um and and you know what what there is to do about that so that's going to be tomorrow and um Maria will talk a little more about Gotitas del Saber and, and what we do with that series um so some topics that you'll find on our uh Instagram and cur of current and upcoming posts um we talk about racial and ethnic studies just various posts regarding social justice movements allyship during the Black Lives Matter movement and just the complexity that is the Latinx identity because it is mm -hmm. very, very complex. And this is something that I am constantly writing about and constantly getting deeper and deeper myself and for my community. Um, and, you know, cause it's a whole label, Lat Latinidad and Latinx mm -hmm. identity, it's a whole label. So having an understanding of the nuance that exists mm -hmm. from the construct of Latinidad creates a better understanding of the many, 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 as, as you know, like, especially Maria talked about her ancestry, the many, many intersections it contains. Mm -hmm. um, so when we use Latina to speak in spaces that require a skin color experience, but don't live that experience, it erases and centers whiteness. And, you know, it, it should be used as a tool to inform your actions and not as an identity. And that's what I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so that's what a little bit what we talk about. We highlight companies, um, yeah, apps and platforms that amplify BIPOC voices. Um, we have something called uh, Zoom Happy Hour. Um, we had one back in September with a bunch of Latinas, and it's a time to just network, um, chismear, which means like gossip in mm. Spanish, but it's it's a little different for us, you know. Um, but it, it's it's a really good time, and we hope to have more of those. Um, we highlight issues in opera when it comes to lack of representation, internal inequitable practices, tokenism. So um, holding these places accountable. Um, we plan to have uh, more posts on finance, finance education. Um, you know, knowing the difference between Roth versus traditional IRAs, mm -hmm. um, how to calculate emergency savings funds things that um, Latinos could benefit from, especially if you're in the performing arts, because it's very tricky to navigate financially as we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, audition tips, career tips. Uh, one of the series that I am in charge of, I hold very dear to my heart, um, is called Voces Latinx, which is a series um, that is a non-auditioned performance opportunity for all Latinx in our community. And it consists of um, video compilations of several Latina and Latinx artists who unite and collaborate on some of our favorite songs. So recently we did uh, Cielito Lindo. And if you haven't watched it, it's still up mm -hmm. on our Insta um, on our IG live. <laughs> and it's it's just, I mean, it's just so beautiful. And you know, you you, you see uh, how we showcase the many, many, many uh, diverse faces of the Latinx community. Um, yeah, and that's, that's very, uh, generally what what we cover it's very we've got a lot of branches um so i'm going to go ahead and pass it to maria and she's going to talk about um the gotitas del saber series which she thought of and is amazing and uh, makeup and skincare con maria series as well thank you cindy very well said beautiful 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 so um we have so many things in our in our platform that we're trying to sort of grasp and and present and when we started the platform, I had this, this idea of a space called Gotitas del Saber, which means drops of knowledge. Something that could help our community get information right away in English and in Spanish. And um, unfortunately, and I know this is limited. I know that Spanish is limited because we cannot forget our Latinx community speaks many, many native languages, which I am not even like aware of or know one word of. Uh, we have a population speaking in Portuguese and so I cannot help there and I really hope that we can change that 
So I, that's just accountability for me in the future. Um, how can I, how can I provide more more information? Um, as well as sign language, which you know there is sign language in different regions is going to change. So it's we can we are right now only focusing on English and Spanish. And um, the, the reason is, again, accessibility to information that maybe people have to pay for with coaches or, or how to take care of, of your eating or, you know, you're preparing for an audition. What should I avoid? We have brought chefs. We have brought journalists. We have mm. brought, um, we have a model tomorrow. Uh, we have brought all kinds of people, um, directors, singers who are doing really well. How are they doing in their auditions? What are their secrets? Sharing with our community, both in English and Spanish, especially for the people. We, we have a following in the US, uh, Latinx people, but we also have some following, some big following in Latin America. And sometimes this information that we have in the US more than sometimes it's not accessible because it's written mm -hmm. in English. So we want to make sure that, you know, people know exactly what's happening. They don't have to pay no one hundreds of dollars that they don't have to be able to get this information. Um, and that's what Gotita says how it is. It's like a well-rounded uh, space to learn together for all of us. And then the makeup space is um, to represent that we all have different skin colors in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So um, I have been moving from, from all kinds of makeup artists, inviting people of all, all different skin colors to our platform and sharing information, sharing affordable makeup brands. We know they can get really pricey and it's not necessary how to take care of our skin um, in an affordable way. Um, and as well as mixing that with mental health and sort of having a, a balanced life and remembering mm. we are all beautiful, that we come in all shapes and sizes. So it's been a lot of fun creating the, the spaces to, to be able to, to make this information available for at least people who speak English and Spanish. That's real cool, resource center. So I am an, an LWO, Latino woman in opera. I am in charge of the monthly concert series, which we just started. Um, which is an audition process in which we pick, um, we actively pick Latin X and Latina women to um, do monthly concerts. So one person per month. Um, the criteria for auditioning was that they had to send us a 30 minute program, including a person of color and a song in Spanish. Eventually we hope to evolve to include women, um, more diverse people um, requirements, because I feel like personally in the classical realm, those requirements aren't enforced enough and they're super important for diversity and inclusion and um, just to show that the classical world is not just European um, and that there are many different languages from all over and many different cultures that have also taken in the classical um, route and have also composed and, and performed. So that's very exciting. Um, we picked like three girls for the next three months. One is lives in Puerto Rico, one is Ecuadorian, she lives in New Jersey, and then one is Colombian. And I also think she's in the United States. Um, but it's very diverse and very exciting. Um, and um, finally, I also wanna talk about the themes that we hope to cover with Latino Women in Opera which is promotion and community, which you can see from the performance opportunities we have um, to promote Latinx and Latina singers, as well as um, showcase Latina and Latinx people that um, can give advice about the op about what we do and about life in general with Gotita Sal Saber to build community. Um, we think it's really important to see people like you. We think it's important to interact with people like you. Um, because if not, then I don't think any progress will be made. I don't think there's any comfort you will get from talking about your, your problems. You need to be able to relate to people in order to take action. That was how we kind of formulated, you know, we were all really shy about the issues of opera. And then we were like, we're not alone. I have these friends here. Maybe I can talk to them about this. And then boom, LWO was, was invented, you know? So it's really important to be with people who are like you just so you could talk and be comfortable and feel included and then eventually organize if you see injustices around you. Um, we are also really adamant about accessibility, which means 
just showing that there are people like us in the opera world and that um, that can inspire younger um, people to get into the opera world, get involved, whether they are opera singers or not. They could be directors, they could be composers, they could be makeup artists, costume designers, all those things. Um, and finally, education. We, we really believe in educating about the current injustices in the world and also in, especially in the opera world. Um, we also really think it's important to educate about our culture and how our culture fits into the opera world as well. As Maria was saying, Latin Americans have written operas, have made it their own. Mm -hmm. um, educating about women composers that are from Latin America, educating about all, a bunch of things. So that is, so those are the hallmarks of our organization. Um, folks, if this is not, um, they saw a need and they, they, they started to fulfill it. Um, and that is the creativity and the innovation um, that, will, that will help us survive and thrive um, in this field. And so I, I give a shout out and I say kudos to you, to you all. Um, you know, I, I, we want to give people a little bit, like Quo says, we'll give them a little bit and then they can, you know, come to your spaces to find out more. Um, but I, right now, I sort of want to want to turn it over to um, Quo for positive notes, to, just to sort of wrap us up today. We've heard so many things today. It's been so inspirational. Um, just the whole community aspect of it, the education aspect of it, and looking at the multitude of backgrounds and cultures that is the Latinx community. Um, that's big. That's huge. And it's something that is needed right now. So I appreciate you all. And Quo, positive notes. Positive notes. As always, listen. <laughs> yes. Listen, listen and, and hold space for others because people are holding space for you. And knowing, as, as we said, just how grand opera is, take that in, take it in and move within that space and knowing that there is more than enough space and it gets the more grander, the more connections we make with one another, the more connections we make to truth, to our communities, to the beauty in the work that we are all doing and to the beauty of this art form. So my positive notes also include, look at who you are, look mm -hmm. at the beautiful things that make you who you are, and then acknowledge those things as well as the beautiful things that make others who they are. And knowing that it's all necessary in this work that we're doing reach out and connect in a way that is authentic and in a way that again, allows you to hold space for others and allows you to take up space within others. So with that, know that you do not have to do it alone. There are amazing individuals doing amazing work as we see. Um, and then know that that extends far beyond our own experiences as we take those stories with us, as we share those stories and as they become a part of who we are. So take heart in that. No, you don't have to do it alone and be willing to, to connect and make space with others. Those are my positive notes from this amazing episode with these amazing women. <laughs> yes. And um, y'all, the call to action as per usual is to be bold, be brave, be innovative, be creative. And we've heard instances of that with the women that we have on this panel today. Yes. Um, they saw a need and they went to go answer the call um, to, to fulfill that need. So where can they find you? Where can everybody find you? They want to find out more. <laughs> so um, we started on Instagram. So you can find us on Instagram. Latina Women in Opera is our handle. Um, and we also uh, have Facebook. And you can find, you can just search Latina Women in Opera. And we're also on Facebook. And then we have our own, you know, respective Instagram as well. Um, if you want to follow us. Or also our email, Latina Women in Opera at gmail.com. Write us an email. We love you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. Please continue to your support. If you have questions as per usual, to, and want to keep the conversation going, please feel free to email, private message us. Um, we are happy to take questions. And of course, listen to these women. Yes. Please. With these women, yes. Connect, yes. And our, as usual, be bold, be brave. And thank you all for watching. Bye.